G'day and welcome back to Torment Thursdays. Last time round, we went into the underbelly to search for our missing sister, Makina, and we got a couple of leads, but we kind of got a little bit sidetracked with the um, Overseer quest, so we're going to do that. I get to try and uh, voice a visitant again, uh, and so we'll see. I'm really interested, by the way, on feedback on how I did the Overseer voices last time, because it took a fair while to do. Um, it's a lot more complicated an editing process than my old approach. And so I really, you know, I'm really interested to know what people think of it and whether it is, in effect, worth the time and effort that I'm spending on it. Uh, and I plan on doing a similar kind of thing with the visitant um, because, again, like the idea is to try and bring together the non-human voices. Potentially, it could do something with Calisteach as well. Um, we'll see. I would love some kind of audio pronunciation for that name, by the way. Um, because I'm sure I'm saying it wrong. Because I'm always likely to be saying these things wrong. So there's Koro and Salamari, who are obviously the people we should be talking to. And in fact, Koro's trying to uh, bargain with Salamari. Actually, that conversation could be pretty interesting. Well, let's just look through. So this is the Ministry of Truth, right? Ministry of... not Ministry of Truth. Ah, completely, think of a completely different game. This is the Order of Truth. Um, and this is the guy that tried to mug us earlier. So let's let's do this combo. Come to gloat, have ya? Okay. So we'll chat with this lady, ah, who we've inadvertently walked into. You recognize one of the parties in this one-sided argument. Koro, the star seeker you met in the reef. He studies his boots, silent and miserable. The other is a tall woman in finely cut robes, regarding the man with arc disdain. When I told you to retrieve the falling star, I wonder if you heard return to me with empty hands and excuses. <sighs> I no longer need your services, Karo. Collect your things and go. What? No, Salamari. I, I tried. I nearly died. And that is why you are unsuited for this work. She massages her eyes. Honestly, I don't know what I expected. I saw a promise in you but also the flaws, and I ignored them. She spots you out of the corner of her eye and turns to, to you, a framing, a framing shark rebuke at your intrusion. Her anger turns to stark amazement when she sees your face. Adan! I haven't seen you in ten years. Ten years. I cannot begin to imagine what your excuses may be. I'm not, uh, Adan. <laughs> She blinks once or twice. A smile blooms. You're a cast-off, she murmurs, studying you from head to foot with an appraising and somewhat proprietary eye. Remarkable. This is rather like visiting a house you once owned and seeing new tenants through the windows. I've met members of your little family before, of course, trailing around in that shadow, looking for clues or trying to repair the damage. Her smile's genuine and somewhat sad. Her eyes linger on yours as looking for any flash of recognition. I can help you if you'd like, but I need something from you first. I'm not going to agree to anything without any more information. Oh, she says, rolling her eyes. Reason, lovely, well, think it over. She grins wolfishly, and tell me when you're ready to help. Let's talk about that favor you want. Of course. She draws your attention to the map of the Reef of Fallen Worlds on her workstation and taps a gilded, ornate structure not far from the dome containing the resonance chamber. This is the Anechoic Lazaret. It's been hopelessly sealed since the dawn of the Ninth World until, she smiles, I managed to in a week or two. It was rather simple once you figured out the trick. I've been slipping in and out at nights, investigating the technology within, taking notes, 
she frowns. Then more recently, I discovered the structure was sealed again. Do you think one of your color? Let's remain silent. I believe someone tramped inside with no regard for the dangers and managed to trigger a failsafe that resealed the structure. She flicks a strand of hair from her eyes. I need someone to reopen the lazarette and handle whatever nonsense the trespassers have stirred up in their wake. Why not send Koro? I suppose I could do that, she says. Koro stirs hopefully. If I wanted him dead by sundown and the entire structure looted by strangers or a flame, she arches a cold eyebrow. Alternately, I could hire someone competent, Koro says. Poor guy. Besides, I can reopen the structure. The concern is what's waiting for me inside. She holds your gaze for a moment to make sure you understand. I want you to deal with whatever's gone wrong in there so I can resume my work. Needless to say, I would also prefer the structure in an undamaged state, as I left it. She smooths her robe. Well, there it is. Will you help? Yeah, sure, why not? Excellent. She, uh, she says br briskly, but relief flashes across her face. She hands you a metallic stalk with a flower-like ridges along its edge, length, <coughs> and a mechanical eye at one end. Simply head down to the Reef of Fallen Worlds, brandish this at the door of the Lazarette, and it should, should open for you. Good luck. Please, Salamary, Cara says, edging in beside you. Give me another chance. I can handle this. I'm going to say nothing. Hmm. She says, looking between the two of you. Salamary considers you both, and then sorts through a work table, picking up a metallic eye. You're welcome to try, Koro. She says, and she hands the eye over, but holds onto it when he tries to take it. This is your last chance. If you come back empty-handed, you'd better be dead as well. Okay, fair enough. Trembling, Cora pockets the eye and leaves, eyes downcast. Okay, so that is another quest. He's going to fail, of course. It's what he does best. I wanted to talk to you about the anechoic lazarette. Oh, she says, her face a carefully composed mask. What is it? What is the anechoic lazarette? I'm not quite ready to issue a definitive answer on that topic. I suspect it was once a place of healing or quarantine for machine intelligences. Even if I'm wrong, this is the find of many, many lifetimes. Few remnants of prior worlds are ever so intact. Um, is there anything I should know about the interior? Is it dangerous? It wasn't. But I suspect that someone or something got trapped inside. Be careful, and do try to avoid breaking anything. Uh, let's talk about something else. Let's talk about Dad. Good. Curious about your origin is quite healthy. I'll be happy to share what I know once you've completed that favor for me. Okay. Well, you're going to be like that, fine. So we can chat with Calistige and swap things out. We can chat with a bunch of people. But the key one at the moment is Snerf. Okay. Snerf, slouched before you, is a figure clad in a dusty, unremarkable robe. Loose folds of rough cloth shift to reveal a vaguely humanoid form with elongated facial features and two elaborate biomechanical arms. You can't help but notice the size, the shape, and even the number of digits changes as it tinkers with a bizarre-looking device on the table. It glances up at you. Its eyes are the size of your palms. You realize it's a visitant, a being from another world. Greetings, fellow sentient, it says, nodding with studied respect. I will be with you in a moment. Its mechanical fingers contract and dance independently over the surface of the device before it, adjusting and tightening. There, I am Snerf, guest of the Order of Truth. What brings you to my workspace? Ah, I didn't quite catch your name. How do you pronounce it again? Ah, it says, you're hearing a brief Elysian in my name, correct? 
A majority of component syllables are untranslatable or beyond human ranges of hearing. I will try to approximate them. It draws in a deep breath. Snellanarga with a brief poem about the ambient temperature of dust and moonlight here. Gonthus, the word that describes the color similar with blue Ramalurf. I prefer the name of your people here. My name is all too common where I come from. The Zams of yours are interesting. How do they function? I'm not quite sure. It says, raising them for your inspection. Extra digits swirl out of mechanical pumps in somewhat nauseating wave and disappear just as quickly. They seem to be as sentient as either of us, but obedient as long as they keep them busy. Otherwise, they scramble about while I rest, touching things, picking locks, strangling the other one. Those in size, I forced them to take up knitting. Tell me about yourself. Your curiosity honors me. It says, inclining its head, I came through the bloom from another world. To be honest, I was exiled for inadvertent sacrilege and perversion. I would imagine that you are curious about my people's uh, reproductive processes at this point. It adds placidly. I would be happy to describe them. I... what? Ah, I misunderstood. I catalogued the reproductive processes of various known life forms, and I often assume that the the others find the topic as fascinating as I do. It is a rather complicated topic, however, so let me know when you're ready to speak at length. Um, so let's go with, I'm ready to hear about your people's methods of procreation, because this is actually, it is kind of interesting. Deprived of the layers of sociological complexity, the process is quite simple, the visitor says. At a certain age, my people ceremonially choose a limb for removal. The limb is grown into a new being, children in your terminology. (sighs) This is where matters become more complicated. The selected part relegates the child to a caste. Armed children become laborers, leg children become warriors, and head children, due to the sacrifice implied in their creation, become leaders. It snuff studies it, its metal hands. As I've suggested, the limbs we surrender do not grow back. In fact, those who replace their limbs insult their children and sin against their people. This is where your biomechanical arms come in, I'd imagine. You are correct, it says. Unfortunately. I surrendered my arms to create children. They grew to maturity and joined me in the studies of various void-born Numenera. For a time, we were happy. Lost his eyes. Then I discovered a melted humanoid figurine. I did no more than glance at its folded arms and before it opened its eyes. That's the last thing I remember. I awoke with the arms you see now. Snare of size. My children, thinking I had disowned them, Disown me, and my people were even less merciful. Uh, it wasn't very your people to punish you for an accident. I'm not sure it was, the visitor says carefully. My work was difficult at best when I lacked arms. Perhaps the artifact hurt my frustration and so to ease it. Snarf shakes its head. A moment of weakness can cost us so much. At least I have found other ways to take my mind off the loss of my family and my people. And there you have it. Oh wait, now here we go. It was only when I began visiting other worlds that I had learned that most species do not reproduce by severing their limbs. Snurf says, shaking its head. The discovery fascinated me, and so I began cataloging various methods of procreation found throughout the void. It was only when I found my way to Sega's Glitch by way of the bloom that I was offered a place to work here, here in the order of truth. And there you have it. This business says, folding us mechanical arms. Yeah, 2 XP for that. So one of the foremen... Oh wait, actually this is what I'm going to do. 
I'm gonna save. Farewell, fellow sentient. And there, there's a reason for this. Uh, Foreman questions. And that is, last time around I did that. He asked me a bunch of questions and I get one shot at answering them. One of the foremen is trying to transfer energy into its children, but they keep dying. Do you think you can help me? Absolutely. The visitor says, then pauses. I must regretfully ask for a small payment of 75 chins to cover my expenses. However, I am a guest here and not an ale priest. The city does not fund my research. Is the moolah. Excellent. Now let me ask you a few questions about the situation to try to be accurate or the device I craft will be less effective. First of all, as you know, this is an unusual case. Machine intelligences are rarely driven to create offspring. Why does the foreman wish to have children? It believes that the children already exist and are waiting to be born. Ah, predestined existence. An uncommon philosophy, but not unheard of. It also raises interesting questions about the reason for the uh, intelligence's infertility. Why can't it create offspring if it so obviously wants them? On to the second question. Has it had any success in transferring its energy to its children? How long does it take the children to, uh, expire? Almost immediately. Intriguing, it says, taking another note. Final method. How are the foreman's intelligence stored? Void arrays, shielded ring coils, or some other method? Okay, it's intelligence rings. In rings, I think. Well, that would make sense from what I've heard of their behavior. Snarf says, making a final note. At any rate, I shall get to work. This should not take long. Here you are. Snarf says, laying a heavy cylinder on the table with a magnetic clink. In short, there is nothing wrong with the foreman's body. It wants to have children. Therefore, there is something in the intelligence's governing spirit, the sub-intelligence, if you will, must be blocking the energy transfer. Attaching this device to the foreman should disable the sub-intelligence's defects. Good luck. Gained item per creative search turbine. Farewell. And we can actually basically find out about the way a bunch of different random species breed from that visitant. But that voice is really kind of... Trying to have an odd intonation is surprisingly taxing. At least I didn't go for a, as extreme a process this time as I did last time. Since this time, I'm planning on then enhancing it in some way. Which means a lot more audio editing. But, you know, hopefully it's worth it. Alrighty. The cripple, the foreman's flickering eyes focus on you as you approach and an intermittent buzzing fills the air. You feel the air thicken and segment around you as though invisible fingers are prodding at your belongings. You have brought a, a device from the Order of Truth, the foreman says at last. What is its purpose? It should bypass the part of you that is preventing you from creating offspring. Okay. Very well, the, con the construct says. I'm ready. So, what we'll do is use the procreative surge turbine to transfer the foreman's life to its children. And here we will have our party do it. Because he can spend effort, and we can't. Success. The turbine hums into life. The fans within whirl and singing a high trembling note. A cold energy pours through the air like blood from a wound, flooding the motionless children. One by one, their tiny eyes flicker into life. One by one, the foreman's eyes go out, and its voice mesh rattles as if going to speak. 
Gain 25 XP. You lost item per creative surge turbine. Go. Oh. The construct says, Explore. Oh. And a full silent. The children watched the death of their parent with wide, glowing eyes. He'd want me to thank you, the old man says hoarsely. But I, you knew him all of ten minutes. Known him my entire life, you ha I have. And you came and took him from me. Without a look at his master's children, Tarnish sets off into the dark. Making some of the little constructs wander in circles, chaffing themselves. One of them is already making for the exit, and one is motionless, stillborn. Um, what we will do is we will keep take the dead one and let the others go free. Carefully pick up the stillborn construct, cradling it. The rest of the foreman's children chase each other a few moments longer before following the one headed for the exit. Was a good thing you did, kid. Okay. So. Let's see. Foreman's brood done. Bunch of tidal attunementy things moving. Um. Here's the metallic eye. Do we... Stillborn Construct. This little figure of metal and synth was cobbled together from parts of the crippled foreman, making it one of the Construct's children. With your help, some of the foreman's energy was transferred into the little creature, but for some reason, it never came to life. So it's not actually a cipher. But it could potentially be one, or it could just be sold for 75 shims. Okay, cool. So... We did that, that was pretty interesting. We got another quest, and one of the things we can do now is we can continue to. We can look for Fulsome, in fact. So if we head around here, that looks like Fulsome. This grisly crime scene is blocked by Fulsome and his levies as they conduct their investigation. So let's start this. This man towers over you, enormously fat and draped in gaudy robes. His expression is calm, stern even, as he regards the bloody mess spread across the floor and wall. The hooded figures on either side of him tense as you approach. He turns to inspect you, eyebrows lifted, and raises his hand. His bodyguards relax, watching you. In the space of a second, his eyes flick over you. He nods, apparently, to himself, as if your presence has confirmed something he expected. What are you doing in the underbelly, Falling Star? I'm looking for someone. Are you? He says, I know everyone in the underbelly and I'm l seeking someone as well. Perhaps we can help each other. He turns his back on you, staring down at the vast pool of blood. This is all that remains of Weedle, one of my protégés. I had hopes for him, now they'll never be realised. The underbelly is poorer without him. The rage between beneath his voice cuts each note, each word shorter and shorter. Bring me any information you find. Help me discover the identity of his killer and you'll be rewarded. He exhales sharply then turns around. The fury you glimpsed in him is buried once more. There is an assassin named Makina, he says. She's known as the White Death. I've helped her find work in the past, but she's become... Erratic. If she is not involved, she might know who is. If you wish help in this matter, ask her what she knows. The creature named Mappa may know where she is. Not promising anything? A wise choice. Only fools promise results. Do you have any idea about the killer's motive? I have suspicions, he says, the muscle on his cheek twitching. And I have enemies. It takes no imagination to conclude this was meant to hurt me. The killer did not slit Weedle's throat and leave him for me to find. No. He spilled an ocean of his blood and scrawled nonsense on the walls. If this is a message for me, I cannot interpret it. Um, I want to examine the murder scene behind you. I'll not have you trampled through his blood without cause. So there better be one. He is beyond caring such things. The murderer may have left by evidence. I won't know if, unless you let me look. He casts a doubtful glance behind him, and then nods. Let her pass when she's ready, he tells the hooded figures at his side. 
they incline their heads. Not much remains of Wilson's former protege beyond a vast still pool of blood with a skinned hand at its centre. A bloody circle is scrawled on a wall nearby. Let's take a look at the hand. A flayed hand with long slender fingers lies palm up in the centre of the blood. The rest of the victim is missing. And the bloody circle? <laughs> It's immediately clear that the dashes and bleeding pinpricks decorating the circle are not random. This is a symbol drawn with careful intent. Unfortunately, it means nothing to you. Before you can look away from the circle, a memory bulges painfully through your thoughts, and the memory isn't yours. Let's surrender the memory, no, ma no matter how much it hurts. Fresh blood streams over the circle, yanking you through the hollow at its centre into the world beyond. A strip of blistered land coils through a void as black as a gaping mouth. The air is thick, foul with, and textured with the slickness of maggots. Nausea slams into you, filling your head, infecting your thoughts. You shove the horrific memory away from you, you know, slamming your mind shut like a door, and swallowing the knot of nausea in your throat. After seeing that, the bloody pool at your feet seems almost mundane. So that would be cold calculating jack updated. Let's have a look at our journal. Okay, so circles in med, yeah, circles in red, is that quest that we just got. The anechoic lazaret is another quest we just got. I assume that the blue means it is main quest line. Yep. I mean, arguably, it could be something slightly different. This could be attunement. Uh, title achievement, but I don't think that's true. So, uh, yeah, we'll go and talk to the mapper. Uh, what time is it? What we'll do first is there's a stitcher corpse back here that I would like to free because I can. So I'll do that quickly. Just you find a jumbled pile of large rocks at the end of this roughly hewn tunnel. The motionless limbs of Stitches protrude from the mound as rents in its car carapace dried, uh, painted with dried ichor. We'll move the blocks to uncover the corpse. Yeah, why not? We'll use a couple points of effort. And we succeed. First rocks are hardest to shift. Once you warm to the task, you're nearly flinging them aside until you've fully exposed the corpse beneath. Examine the uncovered corpse. Clearly, the creature was digging in this tunnel when the roof collapsed and killed it. Its smaller claw is mangled and smashed, but apart from the crushed thorax and a few gashes in its carapace, the body itself is surprisingly intact. Okay, pretty sure that will come in handy in one of the quests we can do down here. I just remember that that was something I didn't really get to do. Okay, so we'll talk to the mapper, but we will do that next time. Right now, we've got a few different quests we can do. Uh, I'm going to continue to focus primarily on the main story, but I know that there are a bunch of other things you can do. This is a role-playing game. It means that side quests are a major thing. Uh, so, yeah. Until next time, have a great week. Bye.